pets make our lives better. Pets make us happier, healthier, more content. It's amazing the effect that um, being with dogs and cats has on us. It's been shown to reduce anxiety, depression, decrease blood pressure, even reduce allergy and asthma. Pets are good for us. And what's amazing to me is that we are so incredibly close with our pets in society today. Recent surveys show that the majority of pet owners, dog and cat owners in the United States, sleep with the pet in the bed with them. Over half of dog owners and three quarters of cat owners allow the pet to sleep in their bed. That's a close relationship. Now, as a veterinarian and a very enthusiastic dog and cat owner, I think this is a great thing. I know we're better off because of it, because of all the benefits that we get from that relationship with pets. But I'm also struck by what a dramatic change this is in our society. You know, 30, 40 years ago, just a generation or two ago, we didn't have this close a relationship with our dog and cat pets. We loved them dearly. We spent a lot of time and energy and effort on them. But really, many people, most pets, dogs and cats, would live outside. They would come in the house sometimes, but they certainly didn't come in our beds. Dogs would have their own house in the backyard where they spent most of their time. So if you think about Snoopy from the old Peanuts comic strip, right? He spent most of his time on his dog house. That was sort of, the, that's from the 1970s. I apologize for those who missed that reference. But I can appreciate that sort of Snoopy lifestyle. You see, I grew up in rural Kentucky in the 1970s, and I absolutely loved all things animal. I was passionate about animals. Um, I loved dogs from a very early age. I found them magical, incredible, just fascinating to me. And yet, dogs and cats weren't allowed in the house when I was a child. Growing up out in the country, I didn't know anybody who had dogs and, house, dogs and cats in their home. It was transformational for me the first time my family was visiting another family and a dog walked into the living room. I was just blown away. I was like, there is a dog in your house. This is awesome. <laughs> And so I can't help but wonder, as a veterinarian, you know, what's changed? How have we come to this place where we are so close with our pets? I know it's a good thing, but I kind of want to know how we got there. And one thing that has changed, that I've watched change in my career as a veterinarian, is parasite control. So it's interesting, but parasites are um, animals that live in or on other animals. So they're things like fleas and ticks and intestinal worms really gross things. And I understand that we don't often think about parasites when we think about our pets. And that's because the veterinary profession has made such incredible advances in recent years in being able to control parasites on pets. And so removing parasites from pets has allowed us to bond more closely with them because it's much more appealing to hug or pet or share a bed with a dog or a cat that's not covered with fleas and ticks. So it's taken that out of the equation, allowed us to be cl closer with our pets. And that closeness definitely benefits us. That's been documented. But I would argue, and my cats would say I was projecting here, but I would argue that closeness also benefits our pets. I think our pets are better off because of their elevated status in our family. And so what are parasites? Parasites like fleas and ticks, um, they're animals that live in and on other animals. The, the free-living species, every organism in nature, has a cohort of parasites that colonizes it. So it's true of every animal, every plant, every organism, including humans. We have parasites of our own. And so parasitologists, I'm a veterinary parasitologist, we don't struggle with that existential question of why we are here. We know why we are here. Ecologically speaking, we're here to host parasites. And, and that's, why, that's why our pets are here as well. They're here to host parasites. That's their kind of ecological role in the, in the larger system. But when parasite control is not practiced on pets, when they're infested with fleas and ticks, it's incredibly sad. And so dogs that are not protected from parasites become infested, and they really suffer from that infestation. And it doesn't have to happen. We don't have to allow these infestations to occur because we have great strategies to prevent it. But fleas and ticks are common on dogs and cats. Um, 
dogs and cats that don't benefit from parasite control will vomit intestinal worms sometimes. They'll, they'll, and that's not appealing in your home, right? Um, dogs and cats with tapeworms, and this is where it gets kind of gross, but the proglottid, the modal stage of a tapeworm that's the reproductive unit, will actually migrate out of the anus of the dog or the cat looking to complete its life cycle, right? Go out into the environment, get back into another host. And if that happens on your couch cushions or on the rug where the pet's resting, you know, that takes an indoor cat and makes it an outdoor cat, right? Parasites are gross. If you go into a home that's infested with fleas and you run your hand over the carpet, you can make the fleas jump up. And some of us, a very small percentage of us, think that's really cool. But the rest of us <laughs> don't want that in our homes, right? So the great thing is that in the last 20 years or so, while I've been a veterinarian, I've watched this evolution as we've implemented effective parasite control strategies for pets, we've become closer to our pets than ever before. They're now in the home, and it's because we've taken parasites out of the equation, we're able to have that close relationship with them. So here's the idea that parasite control and the advances the veterinary profession have made in achieving parasite control for pets has done more to support the human-animal bond to really change at a fundamental level the way we interact with our pets than anything else the veterinary profession had done before since rabies vaccination. Now that's a pretty bold statement to say controlling fleas and ticks is akin to rabies vaccination, right? That's a fatal neurologic disease of animals and people. And yet, to consider that concept, I need to ask you to think in terms of One Health. One Health or One Medicine is a term that encapsulates the fact that humans, other animals, and the environment their health is completely intertwined. We can't separate one from another. And so when a veterinarian vaccinates dogs and cats for rabies, they're putting one health into practice. They're protecting dogs and cats so that they're not able to transfer that neurologic disease, that virus, from wildlife reservoirs in the environment to people in the community. And a veterinarian who's advising that you use parasite control, flea and tick control on your pets, isn't just thinking about the health and comfort of the pet. She's also trying to block transmission of severe, debilitating, potentially fatal infectious diseases that are transmitted by fleas and ticks. So parasite control is about so much more than just not making them gross and not making them, you know, not having a hygiene problem in your home. It's actually about protecting health, veterinary health and human health. There's a number of infections that are transmitted by fleas and ticks, everything from cat scratch disease to bartonellosis to um, typhus, plague, tapeworms, and the tick-borne disease list goes on for quite a while, but we're familiar with things like Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, um, tularemia. It's amazing the number of diseases that fleas and ticks transmit. In my lab, we focus on understanding um, the risk of infection to dogs, and we map the geographic risk of infection to dogs nationwide using um, data that's gathered by veterinarians in practice. And we can use that then to predict human infection risk because many of these infections are zoonotic. They're shared by animals and people. So by understanding where and when Lyme disease infection occurs in dogs, we can predict Lyme disease risk in people. And the same for ehrlichiosis and a host of other tick-borne infections. And this is really important because we can not only see where infection is occurring now, but we can actually predict where infection risk is likely to increase in the future. So it's a very powerful strategy. Um, and it's important, too, because the ticks are spreading in North America, and so we need to know more about what's happening. The other great thing about Working in parasitology as a veterinarian, though, is that there's a lot of us that are really passionate about parasites. I'm not the only crazy parasite veterinarian. And in fact, here at Oklahoma State, we founded the National Center for Veterinary Parasitology to support this One Health initiative and really work with veterinarians and physicians and other scientists to implement One Health strategies that will achieve effective control, promoting both veterinary health and human health. And we um, partner with groups like the Companion Animal Parasite Council, which um, writes recommendations and guidelines for parasite control that veterinarians can put into practice. And so it's really exciting to be part of this process. And I think it's incredible that we have parasite control, flea and tick control, worm control for pets, because it makes such a difference, not just in their health and in our health, but in our overall um, ability to communicate with our pets, to enjoy their companionship, their affection, 
all the entertainment that they provide in our homes. And so I think it's just amazing that thanks to the advances in the veterinary profession in the last couple decades, that old adage about lay down with dogs no longer has to mean get up with fleas. Thank you.